Good morning. Um, I'll give you just a two-minute background on Duratech and uh, the sector we were in. So Duratech is a distributor and manufacturer of um, braking components for trucks, buses and cars. Works in the automotive aftermarket sector and the business was established in 1999 um, <clears throat> by uh, an owner, entrepreneur, who was one of my original business partners. I joined the business in um, 2014. I'd worked in the sector um, all of my career, so I knew the industry very well. I just had a, a, a year's gardening leave from a private equity business. And so during that period of time, I decided that I wanted to look for an opportunity where I could have an ownership potential. I was approached by the original owner uh, in the summer of 2014, and I joined in 2014, in October 2014. The business was really struggling. There'd been, just been a failed MBO, and that was the kind of MBO that Andy wouldn't want you to get involved in. There was a, a lot of acrimony, a split in the business, the culture of the business had deteriorated, business performance had deteriorated, and the business was losing money. So the first objective was to stabilize the company, which, uh, which we did successfully for about 18 months. And then the opportunity then came to be involved in the first MBO. Um, the shareholding split at the time was 75% of the founder, 25% of the managing director. And the managing director and the owner had originally both going to be departing in 2014. Um, the MD uh, who I was working with realized the journey the company was about to go on, so he decided he didn't want to leave and he wanted to stay and he wanted to be involved in the first MBO. So we concluded that in April 16 and uh, I was able then to take 37% of the business, which was obviously not a controlling share by any imagination, but it was something that allowed me to feel that there was progress towards the end result. We then carried on to grow the business and I had a verbal agreement with my partner that he was looking to exit in, say, 2018, 2019. Um, we discussed that over the Christmas of 2018 and decided that 2019 would be the year. And that was important to me because I could really see the business start to perform. I brought in two directors into the company. I was effectively in day-to-day -day control of the business at this point. Uh, my partner was chairman two days a week. Um, and we knew that if we delayed any longer, then the value would, would, would just go to the wrong level altogether. So. We then um, appointed Shorts, and uh, we, we went through the process that Andy described first of all. So the management buyout, we had to do it then, because like I say, the price was going to go higher and higher. We knew the business intimately, and that's very, very important. Um, but at that time, I started to have thoughts around the people I wanted around me, and um, I had discussions with, uh, with Shorts and with Freets, who was our legal advisor at the time. And I wanted, to, um, I wanted to bring the two directors with me. But like Andy said, I knew that they weren't in a financial position to take a, a stake in the business. So I discussed options around where I could gift a stake to each of them, and that was 10% each. My view on that was that if I announced the day of the MBO that I'd bought 100% of the company, I put myself in their shoes, how would they feel? You, you, you didn't even give me an option. You didn't even let me look if I could be involved. I knew that they were crucial to the growth of the business and they were crucial to the future growth of the business to get us to where we ultimately wanted to get to, which was a, a full exit. The, so in 2019, we, we conducted the negotiations. They were relatively straightforward. My business partner was a very strong-willed individual. He had an idea of what his 67% of the business was worth. Uh, Andy felt it was a little bit toppy, um, but I knew what we had in the background. I knew what plans we had, what plans we'd been delaying slightly you know, to, to kick the business forward. So at the time I knew it was, a, it was a fair price. It's important when you go through the MBO process that you are comfortable with the people you're gonna bring on board. You should know the business. Obviously there is less legal, um, um, the right word, there's less legal comfort that you get when you do a management buyout but you should know the business anyway. If you don't know the business, you shouldn't even be thinking about conducting a, an, an MBO. We then went through that process and uh, we managed to conclude that in, in October 2019. Like I say, the, 
locking the sales director and the ops director in was key. You know, we were able to structure it with a um, shareholders agreement. Basically, unless they <coughs> died or had to leave the business through illness, they were a bad leader. And that was very important to me. I didn't want a situation where somebody could, we could have an argument, we could have a dispute, they could be offered another opportunity in another business, and then you've then got someone who owns 10% of your business who's not inside the company. So, you know, you have to have a pretty chunky conversation with somebody. You say, I'm potentially going to change your life by giving you 10% of the business. They didn't have to pay for it. Um, the tax team under Dave Robinson at Shorts was able to structure it where they paid a small amount of tax, and it's a very modest amount of tax, and for that they own full 10% of the business. But like I say, any, any way I deem them a bad lever, uh, those shares kick back to me straight away. So it's, it's, it was fascinating to see the, these are people who are already loyal to you, they're part of your management team, but the um, improvement and the change in their mentality when they had skin in the game is, is, is huge. And that proved very, very uh, vital, um, obviously, because then COVID happened and you then, you've, then got to, you've then got to really dig in. So this locks them into the business. It, it meant for me that I had the people around me that I wanted. Basically, one of them, everything that happened inside the business, purchasing operations, he looked after that. Sales and marketing, everything outside the business, the other guy looked after that, and I just effectively had to manage two people. It's, it's simplified, but it's, that's effectively what it was. We then obviously went through COVID, and like a lot of businesses, it was, it was daunting in the first couple of months, and then we realized that actually there was more business there to be had, and the business grew through that period. We'd, we'd obviously started to post some good numbers, and we'd been approached eight or nine times by different private equity people. You know, the kind of people who are the, a letter just appears in your, in your inbox, and it's, it's quite clearly a generic letter, and someone's handwritten your name in, but they don't know anything about your business. But because of my experience with private equity, I knew from the start, because Andy had had a you know, we concluded the MBO and then it's right, what next? And our plan, I felt, was we would grow the business for six or seven years, pay the debt off. We financed the business through um, cash flow loan through HSBC. Um, so, you know, obviously we're carrying a chunk of debt and your view is, well, while I've got debt, that's going to deteriorate my price. We were scheduled to pay that off over five years, so I felt nothing will happen for five years, knuckle down, we'll, we'll grow the business working hard on the EBITDA, never with a view to I'm doing this because I want to sell it, just because it's the right way to run a business and then you never know when the opportunity might come along. So obviously COVID happened and through that period I was approached by a Brazilian listed automotive braking manufacturer who I'd heard of, global player, and uh, the guy reached out, uh, we had a very brief conversation and I just rebuffed him, just said, no, I'm sorry, timing's not right. We agreed to stay in touch. They came, they circled back round three times through 2020 and 2021. They were looking to grow into Europe. They had a European business, only 30 million euros, and they wanted both uh, a base to work from and also European expertise. Discussed it with the partners and our view was always, well, while we've got this debt, what's the point? They then came back again in February 21 and they mentioned a multiple that makes you just stop dead in your tracks. And at that point, I reached out to Andy and, and, and the team at Shorts, and the view was, well, if you sold that to a UK business, you wouldn't get that multiple. If you sold that to private equity, you wouldn't get that cash up front. You'd have to stay in the business. They'd make you sweat for it. So I agreed to go to Brazil in April 21, and um, April 22, sorry, April 22, and in the final meeting, they gave me a piece of paper with the multiple on. Um, some things I'd push back on. I just thought, well, you know, you, you don't, if you don't ask, you don't get. I just said I wanted my debt to be taken off the figure. And once they agreed to that, that's the point when I suddenly mentally went, right, that's it, I'm gonna do this. So even though the timing wasn't what I thought it would be, you've got to be ready that sometimes an opportunity will come and the shape of the opportunity might not be what you wanted at the start. And then once I asked for the debt to be taken off the, um, uh, off, the, off the EBITDA, at that point I knew the number was there, it'd never happen again. Andy's view was a polite version of bite his arm off. So we, uh, we agreed and we went through the process. The, 
the, the process was quite long-winded. Um, you're dealing with people in a different time zone. They're a listed business, so the level of legals and due diligence was quite intensive. So what I would say is, is where I put plan well ahead of time, you know, you're at an event talking about selling your business, so it might be in your mind at some point. I knew it would be, but we didn't deliberately plan. If we had planned, then I would have boosted my EBITDA a bit more in the previous years. But like I say, timing is, is everything. Sometimes the timing isn't what you, what you expect. You have to know your own numbers when you're in the process. So when you're face to face with these guys, uh, you, you've got to know your numbers because you lose credibility if you are fudging your numbers, you don't know your EBITDA, you don't know your gross margin, you don't know what the effects on the business are. So it's really important you, you, you know that. Then when you, when you engage advisors, you know, they're not cheap. You'll understand this, they're not cheap, either the legal advisors or the corporate advisors, but you pay for what you get. And so you pay for that level of advice and it's important you listen to it. They don't know your business, but they know how to sell a business. So that's really, really important. As well on the tax point of view as well, there is many, you, know, you have, a, you have a, a feeling that you know what the tax implications would be, but then when you sit down with an expert who says, well, actually, if we do it this way, it means this or this or this, that's when you can really have your eyes open. So it's important you, you listen to the advice that you're paying for. You know, for us at the time, we obviously had, uh, we still had an outstanding loan with HSBC. So they had, um, they had certain covenants around our business as well. So we have to respect that. And you have to keep them involved. And the timing of when you talk to them about that is, is really important. So again, you listen to advice from that. I found it really helped us to remain good communication with the buyer. You've got to let them in. You've got to get to know them. You know, they're human beings. They've got likes, dislikes. It's not just all about business because you're ending up, you're going to be working with these people potentially afterwards as well. So I found, you know, we, we had a WhatsApp group and when things got a bit chunky between the advisors and their advisors, sometimes you just reach out, reach out yourself because you've got to know these people. You've probably socialized with them. You've probably had meals. You've got that commonality. So we had times when Andy and the, his opposite number just couldn't get over something. So I just reached out to the CEO, just said, come on, this is gonna fall apart unless we sort this out. So you've got to be involved in the process. You know, you, that's really, really important. And that's what I mean by stand your ground. You know, there are times that the people on the other side of the um, transaction are paid to reduce your EBITDA and reduce your multiple. That's their job. Whereas the shorts team are paid to maximize your value as well. So if you feel that there is something about your business that they are saying, well, that's a threat or that's not gonna happen in future. With us, it was, those of you who bring product in from the Far East, you'll know that containers went to $10,000. So <clears throat> my EBITDA was dramatically reduced by that. You know, we bring in 40 containers a month in and when you're paying $9,000 too much a container, that's a big, big chunky number. So their side of it was, well, you know, container prices aren't gonna drop, they had dropped. They're not gonna stay at that low level, they had stayed at that level. And the price increases I'd put into the business to compensate, they were like, well, you're gonna to have to unwind them. And that was a real crunch point. That was a point where I thought, well, no, I'm not giving it up, I'm not ready to sell it. So if you want me to take that on board, then I'm doing away of millions of pounds worth of value. And uh, we just stood our ground and we just said, absolutely not. And you've got to have the nerve to make your point and then shut your mouth and just stare at them. Because if you suddenly start talking again and fill in the space, you'll talk yourself out of all that money. And if you genuinely feel that about your business, because you know your business better than them, there is nobody else around that table who knows intimately what's happening. And so that's what I would say, stand your ground. When I say hit the ball back over the net, I use that phrase in our job all the time. Um, the two guys who are with me, one of them's a bit skittish and a bit nervous and he thinks too much. So we would be asked for a request. You will get a list of requests that are endless and you'll have answered them 15 times before. Or you'll think, why are they asking us this? My response was just give them what they want, hit the ball back over the net. Whereas he would think about the next six shots we've got to play. Are they asking it because of this? Do they want that? Do they want? And you'd go charging off thinking, I'll prepare a load of slides. And I'd just, no, forget it. Just hit the ball back over the net. It's a process. It takes a long time. And um, that's really, really important. You don't get too, um, you're going to be emotionally invested, but you ca you've got to keep calm. You cannot anticipate what they might want. 
you know, when I suggested to the group around me that I'm going to get rid of the debt, everyone was like, no, don't go for it. Don't even waste your time. You'll embarrass yourself. And I'm like, well, what's the worst they can do? The worst they can do is say no. That's absolutely the worst they can do. It's crucial to keep the momentum of the deal. That's where I mentioned before about what's up in the CEO sometimes. Sometimes, you know, the advisors, especially around the, the containers, that was over a week of backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And I just said to the guys, reached out to me, said, listen, you know, if you don't get this done, this is a red line for me. And, you know, I would only use that phrase very, very rarely. You know, don't threaten anything you're not prepared to do. If you tell someone, if you don't do this, this deal's dead, you then can't, when they don't do it, try and go and resurrect it again because you make yourself look stupid. So that's absolutely really, really important as well. Lessons learned. Um, a really important part for us with the relationship between HSBC and Shorts. You know, when Short, uh, HSBC had financed the first MBO and um, it was a bit of a surprise to them when we were going to do the second. So obviously that, it was actually Andy who had the conversation with I think Chris Alsop, who's in the audience at the time, rather than me ringing HSBC. But equally, if we're being brutally honest about it, it's because if HSBC hadn't wanted to do it, then he had maybe 10 people who else who would have wanted to do it. So, you know, it's really important that they have that relationship with the the ecosystem of finance in this area. In an, in an MBO, like I said before, you should know the business. If you don't know it, don't do it. Um, there are few legal protections. You know, you don't get warranties very much from your from your previous previous business partners. But like I say, it's a great opportunity. Um, we flourished under it. We, you know, when when you when you wake up every day and you know it's some people don't like the fact that the, the book stops with them. Other people flourish up from it and it can be very empowering. You know, it's great, you know, we were able to help our staff through COVID. We didn't take it, we paid everyone's wages full. I said to the other directors, you can't get paid. Now that's pressure, and you've got to go and explain it to your partner as to why we're not going to have any wages for the next few months. But that's the responsibility that comes with having an MBO, and, and you've got to be ready for that. Trade sale, it's um, very involving, very involving. You've got to keep your business that's got you to the point where you're having a discussion about a trade sale, that's got to keep going. If anything, it's got to get better. You've got to make it work harder. So you cannot be distracted by what will be an endless stream of meetings, team calls, information. You've got to have the people around you who are going to do the work. You know, my finance director had to do his function We'd also bought another business as well that we were trying to turn around. And then he had to get involved with a full sales process with a listed company who have an army of accountants. And while he's doing it, he couldn't tell anybody because it had to be confidential. So we had to manage him. So you've got to focus on the people around you because you might be tough and resilient and just eat up the pressure. Other people around you probably can't, to be honest with you. And at, at the same time, you've got the end goal. You can see the dream and the vision at the end Whereas they're just seeing a mountain of work that does, looks like it's never, ever going to stop. So you've got to keep them around you. Be ruthless. And by that, I mean just very, very focused. What do we need to do this week? What information do they want? What form do they want it in? Is it right? Answer the questions. And you've got to drill yourself because it's easy to get taken away by the emotion of it. Don't bury your head in the sand. That's vital because you'll get drowned. And it's easy to go, oh, they want that, it's Friday night. No, I'll do it on Monday. Well, no, because then there's other delays and other delays, you've got to keep the momentum. Keep talking. Crucially, we must have spoken 10 times a day sometimes, and towards the end, it's even more. You know, you've got, if you have like a madcap idea, like I'm gonna tell them I want all my container prices, you can't drop that in the middle of a team's call and they not know. So you've got to run it by them and, you know, the answer you get back might not be what you thought, but then you challenge because you're paying them. So you say, well, you know, why? Well, we've never done a deal like that before. Well, why, why not? So you've got, to, you've got to keep that communication up. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody at all. Anybody that's not involved in the deal shouldn't know about it. I joined a company where an MBO had rumbled on for 12 months, and the two people who were trying to buy the business used to wander downstairs from a really acrimonious meeting in the boardroom and tell everybody in the sales office, he said this, she said that, blah, blah, blah. And it just caused absolute chaos in the business, it just almost destroyed the business. So we were very, very dialed in on 
the finance director had to know because he has to know what, I'm, what he's doing day to day with the, the work information he needs. Nobody else knew. So the day we announced it, there was only the four of us who knew. Um, you've got to balance that with the shock impact. You've got to think about that because you'll sit in a room like this and you'll tell your staff and the first thought through their mind is, am I losing my job? What are these people going to do to me? Who are those funny looking men who just walked in now? And it's really, really important you think about that. You've got to keep the confidentiality and you can't just tell one person because that one person will tell one person and they will tell, because it's suddenly the most important thing. So that's absolutely right, I can't stress that enough. And it'll take longer than you expect and it'll mentally take more out of you than you expect. You know, if we, we thought we'd have it done in three to four months and it run, we didn't sign till March the 1st and we probably started May, June. You know, the people we sold to, I didn't realize everyone in Brazil goes on holidays for three weeks at Christmas. So everything stopped. And then they took two weeks to get working again because that's the way they are. So, you know, at that time you're thinking, oh, I've not heard nothing for a week, what's going on? And you're starting to get jittery and stuff. So you've just got to, got to be ready for it. You've just got to be ready for it. That's all I would say. So that's it really, that's all I've got to tell. All right, thank you. Thank you.